There are uh, several things I love, and that includes things I do, like running under a light train, and things I see, like watching a movie. But there are also things that I love that are real things, things that I can end on and interact with. And this may explain why I did my undergrad training in industrial design. Now, looking at this picture, you understand why I failed to make a career in industrial design, but it doesn't give you a clue about why I ended up doing a PhD in public health. So what I would like to do is to explain how this strange combination of training provides me with a particular lens to look at medical technology. And by doing so, I hope that you will see, like I do, how designing innovations that are increasingly more relevant for users in society is possible. I will argue that it requires the integration of the world of healthcare, systems, business and markets, and users. So now that I've introduced myself, may I also tell you things about thing I find repugnant. Well, I hate the fact that some people make money out of other people's businesses, and not necessarily those that run profitable companies and create meaningful jobs, but I hate those who make money out of speculation on other businesses, and especially so in healthcare. And this is due to my day-to-day -day job in which I spend a lot of time on the one end reading about and reflecting on the social and ethical issues involved in the use of medical technology, and on the other end, examining how research and development investment are made and justified. And this is often where I get irritated. In industrialized countries, the percentage of our gross domestic product that goes into R&D is often used as an indicator of prosperity. And here the assumption is that innovations creates business, which creates jobs, which create markets, which create revenues, and all of this would ultimately increase health and well-being. Well, yeah, it may work this way in principle and for a few. However, medical technology is not a commodity like others. Supply and demand rarely fit neatly. And I'm far from sure that what capital investors have in mind when investing in R&D has much to do with, with health. So, in fact, what struck me the most when I encountered the world of public health is the notion that not all of us, depending on where we we're born, how we we're raised, and how we earn a living, enjoy the same life expectancy. And beyond a few things that individuals may do, or refrain to do, in order to live healthy lives, the overall outcome for a population is largely determined by its social structures, by its capacity to redistribute wealth, and create healthy places to live and work in. So how we do spend R&D money is something that, that puzzles me. In 2009, around 6.4 billion of Canada's gross domestic expenditures went into health R&D. And the percentage that goes to health has been steadily increasing over the past decades. And looking more specifically at the biotech sector, which is made of basic sciences like genetics and molecular biology, we see that companies' R&D expenditure is nearly tripled between 97 and 2001. And for the human health category, it reached 1.2 billion in 2001, which represented the bulk of the, the R&D in the biotech sector. Now, seeing that only 58% of these firms generated revenues, you may wonder how come capital investors found this area attractive. Well, one may see this as a sort of gambling. Uh, investors are hoping for the very few lucky seven innovations that are likely to make them rich later on. And this will happen, so those guys are, in a sense, perfectly rational, but their decisions are pushing our healthcare systems in the wrong direction that is making, less, making them less and less sustainable. And from the world of industrial design, what I remember the most is the notion that defining the problem, what needs to be solved exactly, is often way more important and complicated than devising the right solution. And this is called problem setting. Then defining which solution is more clever requires asking for whom and compared to what. And to answer such questions properly in healthcare, care, one needs to understand what makes some people healthy and others not. And from a public health perspective, it, does, it, it doesn't have much to do with our genes or with technological solutions in search of a problem. Tests I find it repugnant to 
when people argue that the cost of medical technology will continue rising, public health care systems will collapse, and patients will have to pay directly for medical technology. So this kind of solution in, in which only wealthy individuals are entitled to medical technology results, I believe, from lousy problem setting. But there is one thing that makes me wake up every morning quite happily, I'd say, is the desire to understand whether R&D efforts could be invested in designing better solutions for healthcare. And with this goal in mind, I started recently to examine how in practice designers of medical devices define the problem to be solved and also articulate the worlds of healthcare innovation. So I will share the stories of three individuals who design innovations stemming from a university spin-off, which means that a private company was created to develop and bring to the market a device that was first conceived of in a public research institution. The character of my first story is someone I call a builder, someone is pursuing a technical quest and becoming an entrepreneur. He's trailed an enthusiast about the engineering challenges lying ahead of him, and that is finding a safe and reliable mechanism to deliver extremely cold temperatures at the very end of a catheter tip so it can enable the surgeon to neutralize the right cardiac cells, that is, those that are causing arrhythmias in a given patient. But he's also totally engaged into carrying out a convincing business plan that will enable the newly established company to reassure its shareholders at different stages in the process and also uh, provide them with returns on their investment. So he's not simply designing a medical device, he's also designing a company that can commercialize it. Another character who is equally fascinating is an obstetrician who is perplexed about the lack of objective indicators in clinical practice. And because she's seeking out in domains such as computer sciences, theoretical mathematics, the pieces of the puzzle she needs to solve the problem, I call her an assembler. This extremely intuitive and tenacious woman wants to create a decision support software that by monitoring objectively a women's labor progress will improve clinical judgment and enable swift action if a problem is detected. It will do so because computers are never tired and don't have arguments with their wives. But because that tool could also predict birth-related injuries that are very rare, but also very co costly from a liability perspective, medical insurers kind of become, in the process, a significant stakeholder, since it might greatly improve the efficiency of their own business. The third character is intriguing, because for him, business is hell. He refuses to see any word in patents in the field of information technology. For him, true inventions are rare. What happens is that existing technologies are adapted. And this is exactly what he did when developing a monitoring system for supporting chronic care patients at home. And I call him a migrant adapter because he left a lot of stuff behind, including his initial idea that had to do with intelligent agents talking to each other and contracting out various information transactions, a very neat idea, in fact. He also left his institute. He moved his office into a hospital room where he could work very closely with a nurse who had the clinical expertise to develop the content of the system. So why did he leave behind so much? Well, he discovered that his initial idea could be replaced by a simpler system architecture, yet provide user-friendly uh, application that would help real patients. So here, seeking to respond to the needs of home care patients and also alleviating some of the challenges of overburdened healthcare systems seem the right thing to do. So what do these three stories tell us exactly about R&D in healthcare? Well, as you may know, designers never work alone. They have to respond to the expectations and constraints of regulators, policymakers, clinicians, and of course, capital investors and shareholders. So the seas they navigate through are vast and sometimes rough. Some good ideas may get eaten by sharks along the way. And for me, the sea of unsustainable innovation seems to be ever expanding. So for me, the three stories suggest that 
building, assembling, and adapting are three different ways of dealing with the world, worlds of healthcare innovation. So here, one may be solidly anchored into the business world and prove successful, but it also implies leaving much of the control to those operating in the financial sectors. One may seek to bridge these worlds, but the balance to be struck between their conflicting priorities may remain precarious. Who really benefits from reducing liability costs? Obstetricians, women and their babies, or medical insurers? And one may immigrate to the world of healthcare systems and find it difficult to secure capital investment because there is not much money to make out of reducing public healthcare expenditures. So I can't help but wonder, is the system in which we have created innovation is the best one we can think of, or can we do things differently? And of course, my answer is yes. The first thing to consider is to look at the lens we use uh, to look at medical technology. And those of the characters in my stories were in large part defined by their expertise, responsibilities, and motivations. When the expertise is that of a medical specialist, one may expect a device that will address problems that are significant within a given medical area, but which may not be the most important ones for a population as a whole. When the responsibilities of designers are to create a successful business, which is today associated not just with uh, viability, but is associated with economic growth, enormous pressures are put on them for the product to be rapidly commercialized so shareholders' well-being may be increased. And this also implies that innovation that cannot generate increasing profits while nevertheless producing significant health gains can hardly exist. Finally, when the key motivation is to meet patients' needs and overcome healthcare system challenges, while well, we get a solution that overall seems better adapted. And this last observation, I guess, should not come as a surprise, at least not for the designers in the room. Design often presumes that the key end user is the physician or the clinical expert, so reinforcing their ability to diagnose, monitor health states, and do also exciting research becomes paramount. But when the key end user is the patient, like, for instance, insulin injection devices for diabetic patients, the technology rather seeks to support a patient's autonomy and ability to intervene appropriately. So here another actor is empowered through medical technology and one whose problem differs from that of clinical experts. I thus believe that the better balance can be struck between R&D investment that reinforce medical specialization and those that reinforce patient's autonomy and the sustainability of healthcare systems. So what does that mean? I guess that here designers would have to think about solutions that are less costly easy to use and safe while requiring less specialized personnel that enhance the autonomy of vulnerable patients and of those located outside large urban centers and that support collaborative work among healthcare providers. And given the multiple factors that are associated to chronic diseases and the specific needs of a growing elderly population, a new lens must be adopted to look at medical technology, one that goes beyond healthcare system and also fosters community-based interventions. So I guess that the overall lesson I'd like you to remember is that the medical technologies we have today are not the way they are because they have to. Uh, what I'd love to see happen in the coming decade is design that is audacious, inspiring, and socially meaningful. And because a medical device can never be considered as a standalone tool, social innovation should go hand in hand with technological innovations. And there are plenty of examples of so effective socially responsible innovations around the planet, such as those showcased on the Changemakers website, which I invite you to visit. And here some may believe that such an approach is appropriate mainly for developing nations, thinking that rich countries can afford high-tech medicine. But when 60% of personal bankruptcies in the United States are due to individuals not being able to pay their hospital bills, even though three quarters of them have medical insurance, let me wonder. For designing solutions that are more clever than those we have today, 
the three worlds of healthcare care innovation must be integrated. So we have to create a new world inhabited by people whose common mission is to design socially responsible and sustainable innovation. And because health is a matter of too much importance to be left entirely to the financial gambling of capital investors and shareholders, we need to reconsider what doing business in healthcare means exactly. And the medical device industry has, I believe, very good reasons to do so. The added value and relevance of its innovation can only be defined through an intimate understanding of healthcare systems, challenges, and users' needs. And a good thing about this industry is that it differs markedly from the pharmaceutical industry. It's populated by small and medium-sized enterprises that are often led by the innovators themselves. And for such companies, creating meaningful jobs while designing clever solutions is possible. And perhaps to conclude with some examples as food for thought, Providing patients with hospital gowns that are not only beautiful, but do what they're supposed to do, hide your private parts, rethinking the places where palliative care is delivered, such as this treasure island room for terminally ill children at Le Phare in Montreal, or creating neat systems for an effective transfer of information at the crucial time where nursing shifts happen. So I guess that if the group of people like you, who are passionate about design for health, continues to grow, I'm sure many other clever solutions will come to exist.